Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the dedication of the Maker's Monument. The show is a little bit this way, so if anybody over here watching wants to move, you're welcome to. Um, my name's Betsy Pandora. I'm the executive director of the Short North Alliance. It is my absolute um, joy to be able to finally welcome the Maker's Monument to the Short North Arts District. <laughs> Projects like this take uh, tireless work of many, 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 many people. And um, what's particularly special about this project is that it involves community advocacy, city leadership, uh, and thoughtful, caring uh, uh, artists and entrepreneurs across our entire city who have come together um, to make this project uh, a real reality. Um, it is so very special. Uh, it is something that will leave a lasting legacy in our community. It celebrates our history. It helps us think forward. And um, it is absolutely remarkable that we now can say in the Short North Arts District, the single most significant largest investment in public art has been made through a two percent dedication of funding for public art with a major public works project that is something that is long overdue and it is uh, often that we say so goes the short north so goes columbus and of course we would see something like this happen here so um, uh, all of you are welcome to attend an artist talk where you will learn much more about the history and the making of this project um, at three o'clock today um, just across the street at WeWork. Um, so I won't go into all of the details on how it became to be and who to thank, but someone who must be thanked is Director Mike Stevens from the City of Columbus Department of Development. Yes. His leadership, his predecessor Steve Shoney's leadership, our mayor Andrew Ginther's leadership, uh, our uh, former mayor Michael Coleman's leadership all played a substantial role in making this project a reality um, and uh, countless others on the Columbus Art Commission um, uh, as well as Lori Boudreau uh, and many others in the planning division. So thank you very much. Um, Mike Stevens, it is my pleasure to introduce you and have you share um, uh, a little bit about this project. So Mike. Good afternoon, everybody, and Betsy, thank you very much for the introduction, and I'd like to welcome you all. It's, it's great to see the community come out to celebrate um, such an important uh, milestone in our art history here in Columbus. Um, what a great day in the city of Columbus, and this wouldn't be possible without the support of Mayor Ginther and, and Council President Hardin and the members of City Council, and um, while they weren't able to join us today, they do send their best wishes. I do want to recognize Diane Nance, the chair of our Columbus Arts Commission. Are there any other art commissioners in the audience? If you're there, give us a wave. Thank you for coming. It's also, um, I'm going to get a chance to introduce Mark Riegelman II here in a little bit, uh, but it's great that he's here with his family, his wife, Mikal, Diane, daughters, Sela and Aya and parents Mark and Tracy Regelman. So welcome. A, a project like this is possible through a lot of hard work over the years, but it's partnership within the city with the public, Department of Public Service who did the great streetscape project here to carve out these dollars to make sure public art was included. So I, I don't want to leave here without recognizing the Department of Public Service. So as, as Betsy mentioned, this is the first time we've used that 2% set aside for public art. And why here? Well, where else would we do it but the short north? And it's really important that, you know, we're bookending, bookending not only the convention center, but the university and the commitment to arts on both ends, but what the short north alliance and the support of artists and artwork that they have shown through the years. So it's really important that, um, it, and it's great that we have this project here. Uh, we ret a little background on this project, we retain Design Local to lead a robust public art planning process to engage the community in identifying potential artwork locations and community goals and aspirations resulting in the Art on High Street, Art on High Strategic Public Art Plan and Artist Call. Mark was selected out of a very competitive field of 139 artists to responding to a national call. 
This artwork celebrates Columbus Makers culture, the past, the present, and the future entrepreneurial spirit of our city. And it's important that we're setting aside 2% and putting them in public infrastructure projects. We're not the first city to do it, but it, it, we've seen what others have done and we realize that the vibrancy that public art adds to the city, how it creates moments of beauty, humor, contemplation, history, and learning, it's really art for all of us. And with that, I'd like to introduce Mark. So I prepared about 30 minutes of remarks, so get ready. <laughs> um, City of Columbus, thank you very much. This is a really, really awesome opportunity. It's been, what, three years in the making, so it's, it's great to finally see it uh, come to life. I appreciate your willingness to invest in public art and public space, and I hope this is the beginning of many, many more projects in Columbus, um, so thank you. Ooh, what about now? I'll start over. No, I just thanked the city of Columbus. <clears throat> uh, Lori Boudreau, you're awesome. You helped keep this project on the rails um, through, through its entirety, so I appreciate it. Uh, Dan Waiten and all the other city officials that provided documents and reviews and all the things required to make this stuff work. Um, the Arts Commission, Arts Commissioners, in the commission are usually terrible and but this one was awesome like our meetings I felt like I left learning a lot in the project is is better because of you all so thank you thank you very very much the art selection committee um, it was mentioned before it was a group of super smart people and I was lucky enough to be selected um, so thank you all for appreciating my interest in kind of maker history in Columbus um, and selecting me for the project as was also mentioned these projects take like hundreds of people to finish like literally hundreds of people um, and so I don't have time to thank everyone but there's still a handful of others that I think need to be recognized Amanda Golden Josh Lapp of Designing Local um, Designing Local is an awesome local firm they were brilliant from beginning to end they were out here taking pictures measuring things for me like and all with a great attitude so Amanda thank you uh, Rick Martin of Setterlin this guy. He was the type of person I would be like freaking out over email. Rick, we gotta do this, we gotta do this. And his response would be like, relax, we got it. And so he was in charge of, you know, digging holes, pouring concrete, or organizing cranes, getting, ev getting this thing here. It would not happen without him. Um, Lindsay Steffens, uh, the lighting designer from Francis Crane Associates, she was out here in the dirt with us getting the lighting aimed and, and making sure this thing is 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 beautiful um, at night as it is during the day so Lindsay thank you um, Eric Rausch and Amanda Bowen I don't think either of them are here they're local artists Eric is a ceramicist he's he's super talented check him out if you don't know him they were also my eyes and ears on the ground Betsy um, she's here thank you for being super supportive throughout the process and putting together an uh, incredible event today so thank you um, Michelle Brandt I don't know if Michelle's here but she this thing kind of all started at her gallery when there's a cake that said congratulations mark it was the first time i've ever received such a cake and i was and i was like i'm moving to columbus i love this place uh, she's also showing some of the process work um, in her gallery for the next month so if you get a chance to check it out today do so and last and most importantly makers you know this project was very much inspired by the history of makers and makers today people making beautiful music for instance there is a guitar that's in the pattern if you want to look for it it looks very similar to yours uh, you know there was a lot of interesting history in columbus like a ton of it and if you come to my talk i, I talk a lot about um a lot about it but the maker history was super unique uh, it was described at one point everything being made from Toothpicks to locomotives were being made in Columbus, which is just bonkers. And so that inspiration was, was very exciting to me. And so I hope that this is kind of a proper homage to the makers past, present, and future. Um, so that's all. Let's find some shade. Thank you. Oh, we're cutting a ribbon. We're cutting a ribbon. I've also never cut a ribbon before. I requested large gold scissors.
Thank you all so much for coming and enjoying this special moment to officially dedicate and open up the Maker's Monument for all in the community. Please join us at 3 o'clock in the Moxie Hotel um, uh, in the WeWork space um, for an artist talk featuring Mark Riegelman. Take care. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on a very warm gallery hop afternoon um, for our artist talk featuring Mark Riegelman, um, who is the creator of the new Makers Monument here in the Short North Arts District. Um, I'm Betsy Pandora, I'm the executive director of the Short North Alliance. I see a lot of familiar faces or a lot of familiar eyes in the room um, and, and hopefully faces that I know as well. But thank you all for braving a public health pandemic to come out and have um, what we think will be a really fun afternoon. Um, this is a really special project, and it's a project that was many, many, many years in the making. A lot of credit and recognition is due to many in our community for making a project like this happen. Um, but to tell a, a little bit of the story of, of its history and evolution, um, well over a decade ago, leaders involved in organizations like the Short North Special Improvement District and the Short North Alliance began petitioning the city to do a pretty substantial renovation of the High Street streetscape. And um, we are very fortunate that um, Mayor Coleman and then Mayor Ginther and then members of council all believed in that project, invested in that project, property owners invested in that project too. And um, in doing that project, a lot of community advocates um, uh, came to the city and said, we can't let a major moment like this go by, a $35 million <laughs> investment on the part of the city go by without public art being included. So I wanna thank some of the folks that um, really were champions and advocates in getting the city to pay attention to that. Chief among them is Michelle Brandt, um, who is the then chair of the Short North Alliance's Public Art Committee, owner of a, an art gallery here in the Short North, um, who tirelessly advocated for that investment. Um, many others who participated, um, Diane Nance, um, who's here, um, spent years and years and years advocating that the city make investments in percent for art. Um, but ultimately, um, uh, that message was heard loud and cleared by um, leaders in our city's Department of Public Service and Department of Development who enabled something like that to happen. And that is remarkable and special. Uh, this, is, this is uncommon for our community. This is a very, very important thing. And more of it needs to happen, it must happen. Um, so, um, so much uh, gratitude and, and um, acclaim is due to folks like Jennifer Gallagher, who's the director of the city's Department of Public Service, Kelly Scacco, um, director Steve Shoney, who's the um, departed director of the Department of Development, now Mike Stevens, um, uh, folks like Vince Papsidero, Kevin Wheeler, Mark Dravillis, um, uh, James Young uh, in the Department of Public Service, um, Dan Waiten in the Department of Public Service, um, and probably many other city um, staff who have touched this project, but no other city staff member has touched this project so much and so directly and been its tireless champion and advocate than Lori Boudreau. And Lori Boudreau deserves an absolute round of applause. It is not easy to spend a career saying do the right thing. It is not easy. And um, Lori has worked for a long time, for many years, asking, and has been a one-woman show in leading public art advancements in our community and, and deserves respect and attention for all of the efforts that she has led in, in making sure that people pay attention to how, vital important, how vitally important investments like this are. So um, absolutely, Lori, um, your work on this is a real legacy for the city, and you should be very, very proud. Um, Lori had the good foresight to make sure that in doing a project this substantial that it was not done um, without thought and care. And um, uh, through Lori's leadership, uh, the city engaged MKSK, Designing Local, um, and Mark Pally, a consultant um, out west, to come into our community, listen to our community, and help us lead a thorough process to identify a really, really talented spitfire jack skeleton of an artist named Mark Riegelman to come into our community and really help us see ourselves in a way that is just so authentic. So it is very special that um, all of those folks I've just named played a role in helping to coach and mentor and consult with Mark as he led this project. Um, and it is really a beautiful addition to our community. So. I am so pleased to introduce Lori, if you'd like to say a couple of words, to introduce Matthew and Mark, uh, not Luke and John, but just Matthew and Mark. <laughs> um, 
So Lori, thank you so much. And I'll let you introduce Matthew and we'll get going. Thank all right. Well, thank you all again for coming. Betsy's pretty much covered um, a lot. And thank you for those kind words. I do want to backtrack and uh, also call out Dan Waiton again. There seemed to be a direct line between my phone and his phone since 2014. <laughs> We've gotten to know each other a lot better. That's when we started this endeavor. And actually, we, Designing Local, Amanda Golden is here from Designing Local, and they set up shop in the parking lot of Haiku, which was here. And um, we had musicians on the street, and we invited people to come over and, you know, share their thoughts on post-it notes and circle places where they thought public art might go and the types of art. And, you know, we really tried to make this a uh, community-involved process. And there's a lot of community, and there's a lot of um, passion um, here in the Short North, Italian Village, Victorian Village, uh, Harrison West. So, you know, we're grateful to everyone who participated. Like a lot of artists, you know their work before you know them. Um, and with Mark, it was a Bluebird project that he did up in Cleveland, um, which just charmed me to no end. And I hope maybe you have a picture of it. Okay, great. I won't uh, try and describe it to you. You'll see it. But it's the most charming. Um, it looks simple. I'm sure it's not. But it's just those kinds of effective gestures that really can add to a neighborhood and to a community. So we can have work that's as grand as the piece that Mark has done here, and then we can have other smaller, subtle gestures. And hopefully, you know, we'll be seeing more percent for art projects and more art happening in, in Columbus. That's really where we need to go for a city um, with as many arts organizations as we have and cultural organizations. Uh, we really need to up our game with public art. So with that, I would like to introduce Mark Riegelman, the Mark Riegelman, um, <laughs> who has been a joy to work with on this project. Uh, just a wonderful artist, an incredibly technical thinker, complex thinker, and really took a very hard project and brought it to what we have today. It was not easy, and he'll tell you about that journey. And also, um, we have two commissioners here, Diane Nance, who's sitting over there, and Matthew Moore. Matthew is also an artist. He's on the Art Commission, and he did the, oh, and Marine Vander Hayden, over there. Sorry, Marine. Um, and Matthew did a project over in the Convention Center, as we are, the giant uh, electronic piece, The Head, um, that displays people's faces. It's, it's a wonderful piece of our community and um, just a really thoughtful artist and he will be interviewing Mark. Um, so I think with that I'd like to turn it over to you guys to start your, your conversation. Thanks, Thank you. Do I hold this mic? Yep. Am I? Oh, whoa, cool. Okay. That makes things much easier. Uh, okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my background and show you some of my other work. So if you aren't familiar with my work, you have a kind of grounding of what I make. Um, then I'll get into the kind of nerdy, nitty gritty of this project, not spending too much time with the fabrication and the back end stuff. Sorry, Lindsay, I'm not going to talk about lighting a whole lot. Uh, but because I thought it was important that we all leave with a good understanding of what the project origins were. Um, so, so we could really understand the conceptual basis for the work, and then everything else kind of makes sense when you when you see the work during the day and at night. Um, so, <clears throat> I was born in Cleveland, Ohio. So I'm an I'm an Ohio boy. I'm a Midwesterner. This is certainly my home, uh, and always will be, even though I've been based in Brooklyn for uh, a little over a decade now. My mom and dad are here. They're taking video. Are you doing video for the whole thing? <laughs> Remember, I'm Mark Regan the second. He'll try to take credit for my work, so you always have to put the second in there. There's, they've been hugely inspirational in my work, and um, uh, I did an interview with Columbus Monthly, if you've read it recently, when I talk, I talk a little bit about how they've inspired me and how they've kind of created me or, or formed me as an artist. So if you get a chance, read it. I won't go and do it. Their heads are already so big about the article. Um, <laughs> I studied industrial design, and uh, industrial design and sculpture at the Cleveland Institute of Art. At the time, these disciplines were pretty disconnected, and I had a hard time understanding what I liked about both and how they could kind of work together um, and have in, in a synergistic way. And it wasn't until I read a book by Robert um, Putnam called Bowling Alone. And in this book, he talks about 
The Decline of Social Interaction in America. It's a, it's a really profound book. And, and he, he talks about the importance of things like casual eye contact, a good morning, a hello, a nod, like these simple, simple things and how, how they have a ripple effect in communities. And communities with more of those things are healthier and wealthier and happier. And the list goes on for the positive attributes of social interaction. And he talks about in it um, the ways that art and design can act as a catalyst for the social interaction. I actually spoke with him since I read the book, and he said he did not intend, I interpreted it completely incorrectly, what he was talking about, but he really appreciated it, and, we, and we've, we've stayed in touch since about kind of how art can, can play a role. So my first project out of the gate with this in mind was focus on bus shelters. Bus shelters are a place, a thing that I, an environment that I use, but kind of there's an unwritten rule where you can't speak to your neighbor in there. It's weird, and, and, and my assumption was that it's a material issue that there's kind of cold and off-putting materials, and all we had to do was bring elements from the home outside, and an interaction would ensue. It didn't. People were afraid to use the bus shelter. Um, the bus system, RTA, this is in Cleveland, told me that I wasn't allowed to install them anymore. And it was a, it was a significant failure in lots of ways, um, except for it got me really excited about functional spaces and um, that scale, the complexity of doing these installs, the, the number of people required to execute a project. So it set the tone for my work, and since then, I've been really focused on creating site-specific work. Um, coming to a site without a preconceived notion of what should exist, and allowing the site to determine what the thing will look like. And so, my, while my process is fairly rigid, um, the output uh, varies pretty greatly because every site is so significant and, and kind of so unique in its own way. So I'll go through a handful of projects. Bluebirds, this is something that Lori mentioned. This is a, 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 one of my earlier projects um, that I did in um, a suburb of Cleveland on the west side, just a small little neighborhood. They put together their own money and they're like, we want to do a, we want to do a public art project. And after some research, I found out there was a kind of a significant stopping point for birds migrating. Um, and <clears throat> so I, I did these kind of small bluebirds to talk about the location as it relates to nature. Um, and these were kind of these gems throughout the neighborhood. So as you go through the neighborhood, you kind of find ones on a tree or on someone's house. And it was very impromptu, the install. It was like, we're just knocking on people's door. Hey, we made a bunch of these bluebirds. Can we install one on your house? And they're like, no, but Julie down the street would love one. And so like, that was, that's how it all came about. It was very cool and very fun and, and one of my favorite projects. And I still am in touch with many people from this neighborhood as well. The Beating House falls into the more kind of like iconic, bright, colorful uh, category. This is a project that I did in downtown Boston where I was very much inspired by um, the big dig and the kind of ramifications of that. People were displaced, homes were torn down, and I wanted to talk about um, the duality of the, the, the current site. Also wanted to talk about local architecture um, and uh, truth telling, because meeting houses, this is a kind of a, a replica of a famous meeting house in Pembroke uh, where truth telling is like, the, the most important thing about speaking in a, in a meeting house. Groundswell is one of my more recent projects here. I was very much inspired by that kind of weird boundary between land and sea and how that boundary is constantly fluctuating um, and how pilings played a significant role for Alexandria in reaching to the deeper and deeper parts of the Potomac. Um, so as you walk into the piece, you slowly become submerged in this immersive installation um, and these pedestals kind of have ultimately become kind of pedestals for people, right? Like every time you go there, there's just people covering them. It was really interesting, because like I left there being like, people are so weird. Like they just want to be slightly elevated. We're like goats deep inside. And so it was really fun watching. And every project I, I leave having these really exciting moments about like I better understand humanity in some weird way. So this was one of them. Um, and another project, this falls under the play category, so extremely different than what we're doing here, but I, I had the opportunity to design a playground um, in Brooklyn uh, at, at a place called Domino Park. And so Domino Park is uh, where the famous Domino factory once stood. And so I was very much inspired by the history of the factory and the sugar refining process. So kids enter as sugar cane, and they get chopped up and shot out as discards, and they get filtered and spun around, and then they get ejected as raw sugar, sugar cane, molasses and contaminants. So I, I, wanted the, I wanted it to feel very industrial, like I wanted kids to be a little bit afraid to walk in, um, and also, but I, but I wanted the play experience to, to, to mimic um, the kind of history at the site. And then there's many other projects as well. Up River, Down River, Stair Squares, Formation, The Reading Nest, some are more functional, some are less functional, but they're all tailored to the site. 
Okay. Allow the site to inform the experience. Got it. Okay, Maker's Monument. Let me have a drink of water. Two minute break. Okay, so a quick project overview. I think Lori and Betsy did a great job with the background, some background that I wasn't even aware of. Um, but the, when I was first brought into this project, when I was still competing for the project, there was a number of sites available to us, right, like pre-vetted sites. And so the artists were able to kind of walk around the neighborhood and figure out a place that we thought might fit the artwork nicely. Um, I was immediately drawn to the site across the street for a number of reasons. It has the widest walking area, so I knew I, I could do something fairly monumental and still fit within the site. Um, and the Greystone building for me was just such a unique piece of architecture on the landscape, and I love that the ivy is kind of constantly moving, and it just felt like a perfect backdrop for what I assumed was gonna be a more of a contemporary piece of, piece of uh, sculpture. There's also a number of keywords that the city um, kind of suggested in their call, and welcoming, stimulate conversation, reference site history, speak to diversity, front door to Columbus, progressive, share a story, timeless, taking risks, bold. So these are also things as I'm uh, developing concepts, I'm constantly referring back to, to try to make sure that, that the artwork is checking off as many of these boxes as possible. Project research. Um, <clears throat> project, project research is an incredibly important part of my process. It is like the most important part. If you get this wrong, it's like everything just fails. It's just a domino effect. So for me, I just start off simple. What is, how, do, how does Cleveland and Ohio identify themselves? What are their kind of like graphic markers that they put out in public? Um, high, high Street, like it's a crazy, it's a, High Street's like pretty crazy and it's always been crazy. It's like it started as like a, a, a farm road and then it slowly turned into this trolley place and then full of cars and, and places and it just, it's a place where it's, and still today, a place to go witness and be witnessed, right? It's just a, a place to see and be seen. It is it's such a kind of a vibrancy, and that, that hasn't changed, right? It's just, it's just getting more and more vibrant in different ways. Um, aviation, you could go down the aviation road for weeks, um, but this is a picture of the first, um, the first cargo flight. I think they carried 10 bolts or something, right, to, from Dayton to Columbus. Uh, but like aviation history is really, really rich in Columbus. The Columbus Railroad, as soon as railroads were installed in Columbus, they described it as spokes of a wheel. Like this was the epicenter of, of railways in America. Everything was coming through Columbus and, it's, and that part is really, really sweet. Indigenous earthworks. Um, this is like the first public artwork ever, right? Like this is absolutely incredible stuff. And um, something that I was, I was very excited when I, first learning, when I was first kind of learning about sculpture in general. Um, they also pooled a number of very beautifully, meticulously crafted objects from some of these earthworks, which are, which are on display all around the world. Um, so the, the craft, not only was it beautifully crafted, the, the, this kind of burial site that itself, but also the contents within were also meticulously crafted. Ha, ha, does anyone know of this Walk of, Wonder, Walk of Wonders? Also bonkers? Okay, so there is this gr shopping center somewhere nearby, uh, Great Western Shopping Center. He had this idea that in his parking lot, he would have the seven wonders of the world, like meticulously crafted in the parking lot. So visitors, they could park the car and then like look over the Grand Ca or the Niagara Falls or like visit the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Like all these, and this is like an actual picture and like the pyramids, it's like, this person is absolutely incredible. He's like the real artist here. Um, but but it, was, it was fun just to kind of see the, the wild things that were happening. Big Bear grocery stores, I don't think they exist anymore. But bigger, Big Bear grocery stores was the first grocery store in the Midwest that you could go and get your own stuff, self-service, right? Before this time, you would ask for three pounds of flour and they would, you know, some person would bag it for you and give it to you. Big Bear, that's like they had it on display. And not only did they, you could go get it yourself, but then they started doing these insane displays, like stacks up to the ceiling, which was never done before. This is like the first time this kind of display was happening. This now you see at every Whole Foods in America, but like at this point, it was, it was not common. They also had bears out front that you kids could ride, like pretty wild stuff. The DeLorean. Did you know that like the last DeLorean made ever was made in Columbus and like given away here? It's like, what? Really, really amazing stuff. This is like Back to the Future in reality. So the DeLorean you'll see on the, on the sculpture out front. Focus on maker history. So all that research, and there's much, much, much more, like thousands and thousands of files and pages of research that I have. Um, but these are things I, I found kind of particularly compelling. Um, but, but from all of it, I was very interested in this kind of weird maker culture that I was starting to 
see, whether it was airplanes or stacks of cans in a grocery store <clears throat> or beautiful ancient um, um, necklaces and jewelry. And so I had been thinking about this stuff and then I was doing some research at the uh, Columbus Public Library and I found this article um, from 1910, Columbus Dispatch, and it was talking about, it was called Made in Columbus, and they were just talking about all the things made in Columbus, right? It was just a list, it was just like a weird list. And the objects on here, I was just so excited about and fascinated by, it was just, you know, it's, it's just really beautiful. And so it set, this really started setting the tone for what, what I wanted to focus on. So thinking about the mom and pop stores that ran up and down High Street and the larger factories that, that skirted the edges of, of Columbus, the volume of things that were making, the people that were making them, this really became the, the foundation for um, what I wanted the artwork to capture. And in this article, they described that the city making everything from toothpicks to locomotives, right? Like toothpicks to locomotive. Like this is, it's, it's pretty wild, the things that were happening in Columbus. Um, and so I started com kind of compiling a list and trying to figure out things that seemed silhouettes or shapes or icons or objects that really started having, having um, um, a unique presence. Um, so that, so, so for my process, I typically don't do a whole lot of drawing and research phase. I'm just gathering information. Um, and then once I feel like I have a good foundation, then I move into concept sketches. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you a handful of early ideations. Uh, and, and, you can, and you can start connecting the dots yourself. Like, so this is whatever, 600 saws arranged in a formation. So that, I was totally obsessed with O's for a while. Like, oh, H-I-O. I thought people would do that up and down the street. So I'm doing with anvils and hammers. Also just the way that some of these factories were arranging goods when they were finished, like this beautiful way that they were stacked on a conveyor belt or, or getting ready to be packaged. I started playing with that exploration. Thinking of extrusions and how, how people might inter interact with the sculpture, knowing that we have somewhat of a limited footprint, but I want to engage with the sidewalk and pedestrians moving forward. Um, thinking about the letter C in Columbus, and again, thinking about extrusions, when you take a profile of a shape, so you'll see kind of like a whistle profile, and when you array it around a circle, what is this, th what, what do you get? So this is like a series of objects stacked with, with different diameters, and how they start having a, you know, almost like a drill bit effect, like it's, you know, corking itself into the ground. Cookie cutters, I was obsessed with cookie cutters for a long time because I had this great idea that we'd have this day called like Columbus Cookie Day and everyone would come with their own custom cookies. Um, so I was doing a lot of like cookie cutout things uh, and of course hearts, like one of my favorite things as a kid is the heart of it all. I think that's such a cool phrase. I was so disappointed that it's not a thing anymore. Um, but, but hearts as well. So, from all of that, and again, this is another example, there was so much more stuff, but w what I got out of that was an interest in surface. Like I, I, found an, I found an opportunity for a surface to be extremely complex, to show the, the diversity of objects being made in Columbus, but also having this kind of beautiful, lacy, um, um, kind of la uh, beautiful laciness that sun could pass through, that you can kind of see through it, a bit of a transparency that I thought would work on the street also. Um, so we could have something monumental, yet, yet also be airy. Uh, so <clears throat> once I realized that the, that the pattern, like I didn't know what the thing would be, but I knew what the, I had a strong feeling what the surface would be. So I jumped back into the research and tried to uh, focus on things being made on High Street. So looking at the different companies, like looking through books, trying to find the different companies, what they were making, and again, recreating new lists. From there, I was, started doing drawings, security, from there, I started doing little illustrations to figure out the objects that I thought best represented things being made, but also icons that would represent future making. So like a saw blade, saw blades are made here, but they could also represent woodworking, you know, contemporary woodworking, or the DeLorean. For me, the DeLorean is like the representation of the future, like right, it's just one of those vehicles that will always represent the future. And so, and, and so the objects, I wanted them to be kind of historically accurate, but also representative of current making and, and potentially things made in the future. Once I had my list of, I think it started with 75 objects. Once I had my list of 75 objects, I start working with the structural engineer and the engineer will say something like, okay, if you want the structural, if you want the surface to be structural, you have you know, X, Y, and Z parameters. Like you can't have more than 25% openness on this surface. Um, but I also wanted the surface to be completely random, not a repeated pattern. I didn't want it to be um, 
um, wrapping paper, right? There's where the pattern repeats over long, a long distance. I want it to be absolutely random everywhere on the sculpture. So I had to hire um, <coughs> a computational designer to start taking these objects and, and write code to, to lay them out on surfaces. So these are some different examples of like, okay, this code here, it doesn't work. It puts them all in kind of a horizontal position. This code here, the openness isn't accurate. You, you can't really identify the objects. Um, this one is too open. You can identify the objects, but it wouldn't be structural. So there is a lot of this type of development. Um, and some of these developmental materials are, all, are also, um, can be seen at Brant Roberts Gallery if you get a chance to go down there. There are some kind of interesting failures on display. Um, so I'm working with computational designers and engineers, working on the pattern only. And so this is a, an example of the final successful pattern. When you could start picking out objects, the openness is correct, the randomness seems appropriate, um, so it doesn't kind of cluster too much in one area or too light in another. Um, but it's just a surface, right? So I still don't have an artwork. I only have a surface of a potential artwork. So it's kind of a, it was a weird experience designing essentially two different things, right? I'm designing a, the surface, but not the form. And so I went back to the research uh, and got pretty excited when I was reading about um, the diamond, uh, di uh, black diamond communities outside of Columbus. These are the communities that were providing the, the, the fuel to keep Columbus humming. And I like this because it changed the focus from Columbus proper, but thinking about this project as being a regional, like a regional contribution that people outside of Columbus were also a part of the making occurring here. Uh, so once I, once I kind of came across that research, I got very excited about thinking about diamonds in crystalline structures. Um, these layers of, th these kind of molecular layers that, that create these hard edged crystalline solids. And so I spent a lot of time looking at the different types of crystals in the different, in the different materials um, <clears throat> that make crystals. And this, this really became the visual, um, the, the underlying visual for the artwork. Once we have, once we have that basic understanding, it's a lot of like, oh great, how do we make these, how do these crystals work in the space? Structurally, how do they work? How do we then wrap this pattern around this complex geometric form, which is absolutely bonkers, and something that took us, I don't know, eight months to figure out, and even then it wasn't perfect. Even then I was still like hand placing some objects to, um, to kind of fill space. Um, but, you know, this is some of that developmental work to get to that kind of like perfectly wrapped complex facade. Once we have that, there's a lot of 3D printing. So taking a model, 3D printing it, sitting it in the sun to understand how light and shadow play on it. And then we'll adjust a couple crystals, change some scale, and do this process over and over and over again. So we really feel like we have something that would be um, quite exciting in the area. Uh, then from here, it's, it starts getting pretty kind of technical and somewhat out of my hands. Like the creativity at some point goes away and it's just like logistics. Uh, so this is, this is an early rendering of how this thing would work on the, work on the site. Um, of course, we have to think of ADA, um, like cane detection, <clears throat> make sure there's plenty of walkway. We also have sight lines to consider when someone's at a stoplight, thinking about reflection and over-reflectivity, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then from there, Again, it's a lot of logistics. Working with a structural engineer, we have, the site is extremely complex because there's a number of underground utilities. So uh, we have to be scanning for these, doing <coughs> tests, doing test digs to see exactly what we're dealing with, and engineering to compensate for it. So we have a fiber optic line directly underneath, so we had to have this kind of big uh, uh, footer that straddles it, to, again, to make sure it's safe and um, make sure um, we don't have any issues with, with underground utilities. Then basically I give my digital model to a professional public art fabricator and they have to take this model all apart, right? Like literally dismantle everything um, so they can figure out how to build it. And it, it is no easy thing to build. Uh, I think there was 300 different surfaces, separate surfaces, um, hundreds of feet of welds that needed to be all hand welded. It also had to be fabricated from central core to outside because there's no way to get back into it because of all the um, kind of acute angles. So everything had to be done perfectly the first time and then they would slowly add on a crystal, add on a crystal. Um, and the crystals are also made in two, typically two halves, sometimes one single piece. Uh, so they're also, some of these seams, they're doing from object to object. So, you know, they're, 
you know, if they, if they have to connect a half of the saw blade over here to the other half over here. So the fabrication itself was, was very, very complex. Once it's done, you pacifize the entire thing, clean the entire thing, wrap it and get it ready for shipping. It gets shipped on um, a big low boy to make sure that there was you know, no height restrictions. It's a super wide load, so they have flaggers, big signs, <coughs> escort vehicles all the way from Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and the, the one good thing about fabrication is that we were able to fit the entire thing on a single truck. Right, so we didn't have to send it in halves. We could send it in one as one piece, which re, which removed the need for any on-site fabrication or on-site welding, grinding, and finishing. Um, then working with Rick in in Sederlin, uh, getting this thing off the truck, it shipped horizontal. So there was a, there was a lot of work. It seemed so easy, but moving it from a horizontal position to a vertical position is uh, quite a feat, um, in in terms of you know crane power, so we needed like a 75 ton crane to move this thing from a horizontal to vertical position. Um, and then we move it into place, bolt it, there's 60 bolts that lock it all down, uh, unwrap it, check it, do finishing work. <coughs> I get to do final inspection, which was really, really exciting. Uh, and that, uh, that's it. And then what, what you have is what is outside. So from there, we worked on the plinth, so if you get a chance to see that, that uh, six inch cane detectable plinth, which is as custom as the artwork itself. Um, we wanted that thing to just almost feel like a shadow of the artwork. Uh, the lighting, which I worked on with Lindsay, is something to ensure that the artwork is as beautiful at night as it is during the day. Also, Columbus was considered the most illuminated city in America. Uh, and, and so the artwork needed to have, you know, capture this illumination history as well. So uh, that's a little bit about the process in the background of the artwork. Um, and I leave it with another quote from the Columbus Dispatch, a place where things are made, which I thought was such a funny, weird sentence. Uh, so that's all. So Matthew's going to ask me difficult questions now Yeah. that I won't have answers for. Wow, that was that was quite a presentation. Uh, it really lended a lot of. Um, it took all my questions, basically. <laughs> now, um, so again, this is the expose part of our my interview. Yep. Oh uh, boy. You know, I read in your bio that when you were a kid, you used to uh, oh, thank you. sell tattoos in your front yard to the neighborhood kids. And uh, I just wondered, like, were you a hood, or were you like a you know a tough kid, or how did that play out into your? your so it's funny. I was talking to my parents after they read the article. They're like, "That never happened," oh. and I was like, "No, I'm positive it happened." So now we're not sure if it was real, right. but I remember very, very vividly. And my sister's like, "I'm going to blow this whole thing open. I'm going to expose you." Uh, so I remember it being in the backyard. Um, okay. We also, my cousins live next door, and there's also lots of kids in the neighborhood. So how I remember it is that um, my mom had this kind of squeaky pink, uh, you know, those lawn chairs that everyone would have. Oh, yeah. They would kind of lather themselves up in suntan lotion and then lay there for uh -huh. most of the day. And so I remember, you know, bringing kids back, laying them down. I'd take like a quarter or something. It would be some sort of washable marker tattoo. I think it was mostly uh, my cousins yeah, and sisters. So this is like, you and like when I was a kid, kids, no, 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 no. Okay. And I was such a little nerd, scaredy cat. And so there, I was not doing it. There was like no death metal tattoos. Okay. There's no face tattoos. It was like dogs and rainbows. Okay. Well, Almost for sure. But I mean, like you mentioned, you were a scaredy kid. That doesn't seem like, like you turned out that way. Something happened between then and now. Like, how does, how did that? experience it's entrepreneurial it's artistic like it seems like prescient you know in what way uh i don't know i mean it, you're obviously charming fellow yeah. and uh you know uh, you know you, you you do your homework you you're very thoughtful about your artwork um but it seems like you know for a kid to take that kind of initiative everybody else has a lemonade stand you're given tattoos like it just feels like yeah. it plays into. No, yeah, I guess that's interesting. I'm, 
So I didn't even know that I could become an artist till my senior year in high school. Oh. Like I literally was planning on becoming a physical therapist. Oh. And my art teacher was like, she set me down, because I was the kid that was always forging classes to art, I mean forging passes to my art class. Nice. And so she sat me down and she's like, okay Mark, you are not becoming a physical therapist, okay? We're gonna, we, you're going to art school. Right. Um, and so then it was like a race to figure it out. And I applied to two schools, um, Columbus College of Art and Design and Cleveland Institute of Art. And I only got accepted to Cleveland Institute of Art. Um, and so... I was going to rib you about that. About going to CIA? <laughs> yeah, Well, because I CCAD. wanted to go to architecture. I okay. wanted to study architecture. Right. So I wanted... Um, uh, or, or something. So, but, so, but growing up, I was always make, I was always doing something artful but without thinking about it as art. So I was always making my mom's garage sale signs, or I was always like, my dad was a, a, a wonderfully talented artist, and, and growing up he'd always have these drawings around that he would woo my mother with when they were in high school. And so I would always take these drawings and try to, you know, I would try to redraw them, like mimic them identically, even to the point where I was like shading. I remember my father like, I was like, how do you do this one? He's like, okay, so you put down some pencil and then you rub it with your thumb. So I was really trying to mimic these drawings. So my life was full of, creative kind of artful yeah. experiences without understand, having under any understanding what it was. And it wasn't until like my teacher was like, oh, this, there's this, you can do this. Like this mm -hmm. is a thing you can do. Right. Uh, and so it was, so that is when it became very serious for me. Uh, and so, you know, I, I was very, very serious in school. I was, people were always like, you gotta come have drinks with us. I'm like, I gotta be in the studio. You can be an <laughs> artist. Uh, <laughs> And so <clears throat> I think I started also finding my voice when I was in art school. I was always, the, I was always a bit of a weird kid. Um, and so art school, I was like surrounded by other weird kids. So there was like this under, you know, everything started making sense when, for me once I got to art school. Uh, and, that. you know, that yeah. set the tone forever. Yeah, I'm with you on there. That's yeah. it's a wonderful <laughs> environment. And, yeah. and I teach at CCAD, and I love just being in that kind of environment. Yeah, it's really cool. But when, here we are. We're in, like, you're a professional public artist, and you do, like, you've done work. and. Uh, New York, you mentioned Boston, yeah. Mexico I saw, yeah, yeah. Louis, Louisville. Um, you know, uh, I noticed your work has a design sensibility, and I also noticed that you went to uh, Central St. Martin. Yes. Yeah. How did that experience play into your, your aesthetic, but also your processes? And yeah. Um, so I started focusing on industrial design when I was in, at the Cleveland Institute of Art. And it was mostly because I was like trying to figure out what major I wanted to go into. And I was like, OK, I'm already destroying my life by going to art school. If I become an industrial designer, there's hope. Yes. Right? That was it. I was like, there's hope. And I also really loved the drawings. The yeah. industrial design drawings, I would just sit in there, sit down in the department for days at a time just looking at the drawings. They were absolutely stunning. So I went into industrial design first because I was like, OK, I like the drawing. I like the drawing style. I like other parts about it, and maybe I'll get a job. This seems like a win-win. Mm. I spent some time in there, <clears throat> love the drawing, got really into the research. Like they, it's, the research is slightly different. They're doing like user focus, yeah. you know, user research. Um, so, but I like the process of research, gathering information. So I also like the process of presenting to people. Right? Like presentations are very important to me, and I learned that from industrial design as well. So I learned a lot of things, but at the end of the day, I was designing a toothbrush. Right. right, and I'm like, I'm not designing a toothbrush, <laughs> and so they're like, I'm going to sculpture, and so like, I went over to the sculpture department, and then I was there being like, what am I going to do here? There's a, there's literally no parameters. You just do right. whatever you want, right. and so there, it took a long time to f again figure out what those how those two things work. What was your question? Well, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I just want to keep building on what you're saying because it's like. It's, it's clear that you think in three dimensions. You're able to spatially recognize yeah. forms and play with them yeah. in, inside of your noggin, which is, that's a talent unto itself. And, yeah. and then, uh, you know, uh, I'm thinking about industrial design. There oh, are yeah. artists out there that are, you know, that think of sculpture as, you know, chiseling away at a piece of marble. Yeah, and, and then that's you, true. And then you said you went to, all right, read that you went to Central St. Martin. So like, how did that, it seems like you transitioned into the sculpture department. And then kind of went back to, yeah, 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 yeah. So this is a thing that I do, is when I'm around artists, I call myself an art, or I'll call myself a designer. And when I'm around right. designers, I call myself an artist. So I have, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a chameleon when it comes to that. And I think that's accurate in my work also. Yeah. Like so, 
so sculpture and industrial design are like two, two tops, like two mountain tops, right? With, 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 they share a valley, right? Mm -hmm. And so I kind of studied on both, but I play somewhere in the middle. And sometimes I go a little bit up the hill on the sculpture side, and sometimes I go a little bit up the hill on the industrial design, uh, uh, industrial design side, but I see them very much as being constantly intertwined. Yeah. And you see that, like, you, if you were to plot out all my works on a, on a line with sculpture here and industrial design here, you know, there'd be, they would be spaced, there'd be a pretty even spacing throughout. Okay. Um, so, so those industrial design courses that I was taking <clears throat> was nice because I was there with like hardcore industrial designers and mm -hmm. some of my closest friends are still doing industrial design. So I was able to pull things that they were working on but applying it to, you know, sculpture. Mm -hmm. uh, and same with my art friends, like listening to them talk about some of their concepts and narratives and then taking some of that and applying it more to my design work. Um, so I'm, a, you know, again, I'm trying to play between both worlds, but, but do, do both of them justice at the same time. Do we really need to have those as separate? Well, I don't realize they're two finite disciplines, but I don't know that we're, are we in an age where we can be fluid, completely fluid? Yes, definitely, but I don't know that <clears throat> they are different, yeah. right? There's like, there's different output for, right. industri for industrial design and sculpture. They're, they are yeah. very different disciplines. Right. Very functional and, versus... Exactly. Right. Or in, in, in sculpture, you could say, okay, they could be functional. It functions in some ways. Yeah, okay, we could do the arg we could play that, arg that kind of semantic game, but I think they are different, and I don't mind them being different. Yeah. And I think if you understand the core of both, it just makes blurring the line between the two even more fun. Uh, so I'm, I'm not a, I, I absolutely think that there should just be a wonderful crossover between all these disciplines, but I do think that there are core differences between each, which make them special. Yeah. Um, and that will allow you to, to be more fluid with how you kind of traverse that landscape. Right, right. So we're, um, you know, I thought you did a, a wonderful job sort of going through your work. Um, and I definitely want to talk about the influence of history and the sense of home that you have. Yeah. But where does, where does Maker's Monument fit in your, you mentioned the two valleys, but yeah. also there's, you know, how would you, how does it fit? So this is, this definitely is on the sculpture mountain, yeah. right? The, the ut there is very little utility here. Okay. Um, I think it does like things like draw people down. Like one of the one of the primary functions was to draw people down down the street. Okay. Um, thinking this being this being one sculpture of many that will slowly act as breadcrumbs to pull people from the, the kind of central core down yeah. the block. Um, so it it has some functional characteristics, but is very much like a monumental sculpture. Yeah. Uh, and so I think the 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 research process you could say was pulled from my industrial design background. Mm -hmm. um, I think the way that it was developed and even fabricated, maybe, no, even fabrication. I don't know, there, then it starts getting a bit wishy-washy, but I, I consider it more of a kind of a, a sculpture as opposed to like a, a, my picnic tables, for instance, yeah. which yeah. are very, very much about function first. Well, I mean, the function, but also that's it's very strong in the community aspect of mm. it. It's really, yeah. it's a really cool piece. It, it was conjoined picnic tables yeah. in a sort of modular fashion where you would be encouraged to interact with other people, sit down and have a meal with other people. And have these. Yeah, and the, the, the idea behind that is, is like a picnic table, a picnic for me and my, so my family is, there is a wide variety of opinions in my family, right, and beliefs and everything else. And a picnic table is one of those places where it all collides, right, and you still, but you leave loving everyone, right, for the most part. Sometimes you hate your uncle for like a couple months. But for the most part, it's like you bring it all together, you hash it out, you eat some food, you laugh, and then you go, and then you kind of all go back home. And so I wanted the picnic table to kind of mimic that, that diversity of thought that happens just within a family. Um, and so, so each modular unit consists of three arms. And this is like a quintessential, the profile of the, the table is a quintessential picnic table. Top two seats, like that crossbar. It's a little bit more elegant. It's all welded aluminum, but the tops are still wood. And I use different species of wood for each one and different, um, uh, different patinas on the wood for each one. So it talks about that convergence of ideas through material and color. Um, so there is kind of like a, kind of a conceptual narrative 
driving that piece, but mm -hmm. the proportions are absolutely flawless. Like when you sit at the, on that bench and put your arms on that table, it is the most ergonomic picnic table you'll ever sit on. Have you ever sat on it? No, I want it's to. It's sweet. I made it for me too. Oh, if okay. you're six foot three and a half, you are going to love this table. <laughs> it's really comfortable. I mean, it just, it just, the second you see it, you, you start thinking family and you yep. start thinking community. It's totally. a wonderful piece. And, but you. I want to get back to makers and you just mentioned that you want it to pull people up the street, which is a way of thinking like it's part of a larger community. Yep. This piece is part of a larger collective. Yep. Um, and you know, uh, I know Lori and Betsy both mentioned the amount of effort and, uh, and research and, and um, hope, honestly hope, that went into making this part of a, a community piece. And I was kind of thinking about also, you know, all of the stuff you went through, all of the iterations, all of the research, and then also working with the infrastructure uh, infrastructure and any public art piece is has tons of challenges. Yeah. Um, what were some of your maybe you know favorite moments, like interacting with people that wanted to help you along the way, or what, what were some of those uh, moments where you felt like this is going to happen? I don't even know that I felt like it was going to happen until like a month ago. Oh. <laughs> I think I kept being like, oh my God, this isn't going to happen. How are we going to make this happen? I mean, it was, this, was a, this was probably the most challenging public art project I've ever done. Wow. Certainly the most complex for a number of reasons. Underground utilities, site constraints for like pulling up semis and, and, and um, 100 ton cranes into location. The permitting process for Columbus is the most rigorous I've ever had to deal with. And this is like... I've done projects in San Francisco, San Diego, New York City, Boston, you know, like uh, lots of major yeah. cities. Um, so it, <clears throat> I don't think there was ever a point that I was super, I, that I knew was gonna happen. Like once we started getting into fabrication, I think Laura and I both started breathing a little bit more easily. Yeah. But even during that process, they were like, you know, the fabricator would call me, they're like, we have no idea how we're gonna do this. Uh -huh. <laughs> And I'm like, okay, who is your smallest welder? At, some, at one point, I was like, who is your smallest welder? Oh. And they we're literally dealing with the smallest people in their shop to like get into places to like figure out how to weld some wow. of the stuff together. Uh, so, so after this talk, I'm going to go sleep for like a month. Okay. Well, you've earned it. You've definitely <laughs> earned it. Uh, yeah, but it, it, so I don't think that I was ever overly optimistic. I was trying to be realistic at every point and just, and that's my nature in general, think about all the things that could go wrong and try to have a plan. And, right. and so Rick, as I mentioned the dedication, I would send like 12 page emails to Rick with all the things that I wanted him to make sure that he was aware of. And he would just send me like a one line email back that says, we got it. Uh, that's the best way of handling me. That's right, Lori? <laughs> But that's a great example, right? Yeah. Um, we, we have our own role in each of our projects. Yeah. And we trust, like you said, you trusted the fabrication yeah. um, uh, company to, to manufacture it to your specifications. Yeah. But it's all those other people that come together and bring their expertise yeah. and their joy to the project. Yeah. And I think about, you know, the guy driving the truck up to, you know, where was it fabricated? Just Phoenix, see? Arizona. Okay, that's a long drive. It's a long drive with a you know Hundreds sculpture on the on yeah. the on the low boy. Um, but you mentioned Rick, but like like, where's there, there is there any moment during the process where you're like, oh my God, they got this, you know? Did they find that smallest welder? I've, I've got a mental picture. Yeah. Here. <laughs> <laughs> I think you got it better out for me. It's like a circus. They're like circus welders. Right. Exactly. Like, um, I mean, I, I really try to bring the best people on board from day one, yeah, right? So yeah. there is a, <clears throat> I, while I might get super absorbed in like these details that could go wrong, mm -hmm. I, I'm usually very confident that I, I have the best, like Bollinger, the fabricator, they are one of the best fabricators in the country, if not the world, right? Like they are a top tier fabricator. So while I might be really concerned about a well detail or how they're gonna break something, I know at the end of the day that we'll figure it out, right? And that's a, that's a good thing to have, yeah. like as, as, a, as, a, as a backstop. Um, the structural engineer, you know, brilliant structural engineer doing massive buildings in New York City, 
Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, I, I try to, every project, I try to tailor the team with the best folks I can find. Um, and that helps make sure. But again, Rick, not to harp on Rick, like, he was such a lucky find. I've never worked with a contractor that was, ha, has been so great, even with the, the, the people who poured the concrete, right? This like, this big guy who's like smoking cigarettes and was like, oh no, what is this, who is this guy? And then as soon as you start seeing him, seeing him work, he's like, he's just doing the most beautiful things, like s gently rubbing the concrete and like being so elegant with it. And like at the end, I'm just hugging him because I'm yeah. like just loving them. And even the, you know, they, they planted, uh, we finished the landscape a couple days ago and there's bushes in front of, um, they put bushes right in front of the lights. And so I'm like calling Rick, I'm like, Rick, there's bushes in front of the lights. This is seven o'clock. And I'm calling Laura, I'm like, Laura, there's bushes. Which she's like, I'm gonna bring my shovel. Don't worry, we're gonna figure it out. <laughs> and it's like literally eight o'clock, she's like, I'll meet you there at 7.30. And I'm like, I'm like, I didn't bring my gardening clothes. <laughs> and, and then Rick's like, don't worry, we got it. And then there's these, these like beautiful landscapers out there this morning and they're talking with me about it. They're showing me how to do it and they're being, they're laying down mulch, sweeping everything so perfectly. It, it, so I, Rick just brought, helped bring in extra people that were, that were also really good. But the community is important and I, um, I take that very seriously when I'm working on projects. So I try, the landscapers this morning, there's three of them. I try to make sure that I shake hands and remember every one of their names um, and go, you know, go get them a coffee or something. And I do that. And I try to do that with everyone that's part of it because I want everyone to know that these things can't happen without all these people. Um, yeah. and, and I've been told that artists tend to think that they're the only ones um, doing it. And so I, I really make an effort to acknowledge all the folks that are doing you know, all, you know, all the stuff. You know, there's like 13 people for install day or 20 people on install day doing a variety of different things. Yeah. Um, it and shows. It shows. It just like any time I was talking about this project with somebody on the commission or, or outside of the commission, there was just a nice sense of momentum. I know it took a long time, yeah. but the joy of creating something beautiful and something important and and uh, meaningful really does. You know that it, it really that momentum carries it yeah. in a wonderful way. Yeah. Um, and I remember, you know, hey, it's in. Come on down. Take take a look. I driving up. High street. I'm like, oh my god! It like erupts out of the, yeah. street, out of the sidewalk. I'm like, wow! It's yeah. such, you know, it's just a, it's just a, a, such a great form and such a uh, so dynamic. Yeah. And and then you get closer, and there's the you know then there's the the positive negative space of the shapes, and the and the and the holes that you can see it more dimensionally. Yeah. And it's just a nice like little eye game, little mental game. You can to see the shapes. It's not a one trick pony. It's the kind of thing you could really spend some time and enjoy. Yeah. I don't have a question there. It's just, no, I, and just, it's, I think it's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, and it was nice watching. So every time I've been here, I've been doing a lot of stuff. So this morning was the first time that I didn't really have anything to do. So I was just able to sit across the street and just watch people interact with it. Mm -hmm. And it was a lot of like, some people don't even notice it, which I think is amazing. Mm -hmm. But most, most people were kind of like walking by and they kind of stare and walk past. And they'll be like 15 feet past, and then they walk back and like look a little bit more closely. And I can't, I couldn't tell if they're actually finding an object, but they're, it seemed to be doing what it was intended to do, which is like really catch people from a distance, like draw them in, and then offer the opportunity for them to explore further if they want. Um, but but I wanted to design a very dynamic form. The cantilever was something that it took a while for us to engineer. I wanted it to kind of sit over top of the sidewalk a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I wanted it to be very much contrasting the architecture of the environment, which is like horizontal and vertical lines. So I, I wanted it to, to be able to compete in this very busy landscape. Yeah, um, it definitely challenges the architecture around it yeah. in a great way. Well, and I was also hoping, w one of the reasons why I selected the site, because there's a parking lot there, and there's no chance it's going to stay a parking lot for long, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to turn into a building at some point, one could assume. Um, and so I also thought that you know, getting in on the ground floor of this project, like there, maybe there's a hope for the architecture to consider the artwork yeah. in some interesting way, right? So, so there's an opportunity for the art and architecture to really be complementary. Um, I don't know if that'll happen, but it was something that from the beginning I thought that there was, that it could. Well, th they will definitely have to reckon with it, at yeah. the very least. For sure. But let's hope they embrace it, right? <laughs> exactly, you know, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a good thing to think about, right? Yeah. Um, 
and I'm thinking about uh, also in terms of the community and how many places you've done work in and uh, how important uh, the percent for art programs are. Yeah. I mean, have you seen that in your other projects and how, how important was that for, for this? That it was a percent for art? Yeah, well, I think, I, think, I mean, it's, maybe it's a, it's a much larger question. It's, it's not specifically about you, but it's, I think it's about all public artists. Like, what have you seen in your uh, experiences? I mean, I think, <clears throat> I don't even like saying the word COVID because I'm just like so over it, but I think what COVID certainly has done is force everyone to reconsider public space and how we interact in public space. Um, and how we invest in public space. So I, I think I was very concerned that once COVID started, I was like, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I have to change my career. Right. Literally, like, their public space is done. Like, right. we're, this, I, th I thought about the same thing. Right? It's like, and that's like, a scary oh. thing to think about. Yeah. Um, all these people are dying, and I'm thinking about myself, of course. I'm like, my career? <laughs> what do I do? <laughs> uh, so I didn't mean it that way. I just meant, like, there's lots of, ram I was very concerned about the overall ramifications of, because my interest is in social interaction, suddenly it's like you can't see someone grin with a mask on their face, right? Like maybe you can check their eyes, but maybe they just have something in their eyes. So it's like things become very confusing. Um, so I was very, I was very concerned about how it would impact public space, um, and in fact, it's had the reverse effect. Like people are, cities have quickly realized that we need more interesting, vibrant public spaces. We need to keep people outside. We need to keep people happy. Keep people excited, interested in public space. Um, so I imagine that this trajectory is going to stay consistent across the across the country, and I think in Columbus, yeah. uh, in Columbus as well. I hope so. Yeah, there, um, you know, both again, both Lori and Betsy mentioned that we want to see more projects, and Diane and, and Marianne were all part of hoping that. Um, what was the quote up here? Columbus makes things. Uh -huh. We're hoping yeah. they uh, <laughs> they own up to that, and, yeah, totally. and it's not just manufacturing, which actually brings up a good point. How am I doing on time? Okay, a couple more questions. So you, like your, like you are able to, in all of your work, not just this one, uh, tap into the historic, the the vibrancy, and and the, you feel the history in the piece, and um, you also make it feel uh, part of, like you see it, and you make it makes me feel like I'm part of, this is my home, this is part of my heritage. And um, I mean, I was thinking about um, like what, like how do you, I, I know it's part of the artist's um, responsibility, but how do you find that balance between history and the moment? Yeah. That's, I threw you a curveball there. No, it's a, it's a, it's a good question, um, but I'll, give you a curveball response. So it's, I can't do it on my own, is, ba is the short answer. Like I, I rely on people that are familiar with the project, uh, familiar with the site, um, to help make sure that the project is grounded correctly. Mm -hmm. um, so so I'm, a, I'm an outsider for every single project, right? And being an outsider for a project is inherently difficult. And I have to rely on other people to say like, you know, I'll often, and this is kind of where the Arts Commission was played a little bit of that role here, um, in, including designing local as well, um, and Lori, but like sharing concepts or ideas and being like, does this feel like it resonates? You know, is, is, are there parts of this that, that resonate? And, and people will be like, oh, this is interesting. And not that I will just do what other people say, but if I get some, if I get some feedback that will allow me to make sure the work is really grounded, mm -hmm. um, then... <clears throat> then I have a hope of it being successful. I also want my work, I will often describe my process uh, as being, like I want my mother and father who don't have like an extensive art background. I want them to be able to leave with a meaningful experience with the artwork. Mm -hmm. um, and I also want my professor, Charles Tucker, to have a meaningful experience with, with the artwork. So mm -hmm. ju just thinking about 
how one, how these two very different people with two very different backgrounds in education could both leave with with a meaningful experience, but two different experiences, right? Like mm -hmm. Charles Tucker is going to be thinking about how this relates in uh, historically in art history and the diagonals or something. And my dad will my dad will be thinking about the fabricability of the piece and yeah. um, the structural engineering. My mom will think about how the kids play on it or how kids move past it, whatever it is. So I, I just try to think about the experience from very from a lot of different people to make sure that that experience is dynamic. And I think the, that will inherently give me a piece that finds a nice balance, because I'm like, I'm trying to balance the total experience, if that makes sense. It makes perfect sense, okay. right? Great. I mean, we build things with layers, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yep. I think maybe my final, I don't even know if it's just, I'm not even, I don't know if there's a question at the end, end of this, but there's a genuine sense of joy that, I've, that I, when I look at all of your work, and as, you know, I'm so glad to see this piece here. Just the joy that comes out. And I, just, I guess my statement would be, it, it's been a joy working with you and it really comes, comes out in the piece. Well, thank you very so, much. Thank it's you a, very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you both so much for um, having that wonderful conversation for all of us to enjoy. Does anyone have any questions that they would like to ask of Mark while we have his time, please? Like and I'm going to give you the microphone to speak into so that they can have it recorded, OK? Um, I haven't been at night yet. How did the lights work? What do they do? Um, they strobe. No, I'm kidding. They're just white lights. But actually, if you stop by tonight, um, Lindsay's here. She came down from Cleveland. She's a lighting designer. My wife is here also. Um, we're just going to be tinkering with some color gels later. So if you're around, maybe like 9:30 or something. But on a on a on a nightly basis, they'll just be illuminated with like a nice kind of soft, warm light. Um, and it does really beautiful things. Like if you if you find yourself. So there's lights coming from the north and south. So if you find yourself on the, on the eastern edge of the piece and look up, it has this, this nice kind of internally illuminated feel. And you could start seeing the cutouts in a really interesting way. But there's no special features. I didn't want anything flashing or changing. A lot of times those things are just headaches in the future anyways if it does too much. Um, and so it's just simple and clean and just helps really create more of a landmark in the streetscape at night. Any other questions for Mark? Yes? Well, this is more of a comment than a question. But um, so I'm a, you know, working with Mark. Um, I've lit other public art pieces. But um, one of the things that Mark was, both of you were talking about is how you're both a sculptor but you have a design background. So for me, that really kind of was fun to work with Mark because I work with architects mainly, and I've worked with some sculptors, but Mark has a design sense. And I was like, oh, that's so great. Because sometimes I work with artists and they, the, the, it's just a different, I don't know, I'm not saying it's worse, or but having that design sense brings um, a, a certain, I guess, I, I think it's like, it's almost like a sense mm -hmm. knowledge. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I definitely, like, I appreciate that. And about Mark's other work, too, like what we were just talking about. I live in Cleveland. Those um, picnic tables. So if you see them, they're really, it's an art piece, but they're, the design is incredible, the details, and you know, if you're a designer, you always pick everything apart. So yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's it. I just want to comment. Thanks. I think that's worth, yeah, I think that's worth discussing. I, I, I don't know if it gives us an advantage, or I think, I mean, for the better part of my career, I've been doing things in service of, of other clients, and it's been nice to recapture that. But that design sensibility definitely plays into being able to communicate effectively, yeah. and um, I think it's it's been a bit of an impediment because we need to, as artists, you need to be uh, we need to create, you know. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But uh, I don't know. Have you have you felt that? I mean, I e yes. I think <clears throat> I feel like I often have 
a hard time like letting my hair down or something. Mm. Like, and I see my I see my other artist friends work, and they leave the studio like covered in paint, right? And like exhausted, and I'm like smoking a cigarette. And I'm like, oh, that's so cool. It is cool. I want to work. I want to work like that. And I'm not like that at all. I know. And, and so, <laughs> you know, like my studio is like pretty darn meticulous. I have like a wall of 3D prints and like a color sample wall. And like sometimes I don't feel like an artist enough. I'm like, I gotta mess it up. So I'll like push things over <laughs> to try to feel more artsy. But it is, it is a, it, there seems to be a constant tug of war. Cause yeah. I think that there are some advantages of both. Yeah. Like I see my art friends not being kind of encumbered by all the lo nonsense logistical stuff right. that I spend so much of my days working on. And I can see that being an advantage of where you, you know, you're just like exploring and then you just pass it on to someone else to figure it out. It's like, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, the other part of me is I am so, um, I'm such a control freak about everything. Right, Lori? <laughs> that, uh, you know, I liked, and I, th I blame this on my father, I like to do everything myself, mostly because I want to know how to do it. Right. Or, like, I really want to know prevailing wage or, or, or structure engineering or landscape. I want to know all of it, so I want to yeah. be a part of it. So I'm always afraid that, like, Lindsay, I send Lindsay, like, also 600-page emails, and I'm like, Lindsay hates me. And I, always, I normally start my emails with, I'm so sorry. <laughs> like, I'll just say, I'm so sorry for this email. But I just can't stop myself. So I think it helps to, like, also let people know that I'm neurotic. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but there's a weird tug. Do you feel that a weird tug, tug I, of war I between think that's art? That's why you asked me to do the interview. Because I mean, like, you're, you, you sound we sound a lot alike. I'm yeah. a total control freak. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> yeah, but it's it's it, you know, it's almost like you have to work to get into a true like creative streak. You're yeah. doing the history. I'm I'm monopolizing the time. Sorry, you're doing all the the research, and I just I can appreciate that as well. That's definitely from a design centric um, discipline. Yeah. You know? For sure. Other questions? Oh, yes. Hey. Eliza. Hello, Mark. Congratulations Hello, to your piece. Thank we you. met a couple of times at yep. the Arts Commission meetings, so yep. I am very happy to see this work, you know, realized. So I was just reading your biography, you know, in the, in the pamphlet. So I recognize that you found yourself most proud of the 2019 <laughs> being, being awarded as one of the coolest that, uh, you know, uh, on the planet, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm very curious about, because, you know, in your talk, you also talk about your mom and dad, and maybe you actually talk about your kid, you know, earlier, and then I missed that part, and I'm sorry about that. But I'm just very curious about how the journey of fatherhood um, have influenced you, and or maybe just the perception of you know becoming a father, and now that you you know you are a father, how how does that you know um, influence your artistic journey? Jesus, <laughs> that's like pretty deep. Uh, Okay, so <clears throat> I'll start with the parent thing because I think it's slightly different. P uh, pr feeling pr the, the f having the feeling of pride is like a weird feeling for me, and I don't. I've never quite been able to figure it out because it's like feeling pride. What did I do? Like I, I kind of gathered information, funneled it together, created a project. It's like, okay, I really only have these tools because my parents gave them to me either through genes or through some education that I don't remember. So it's like, it, that, that's always felt, so I always feel like I'm, I'm just a, it is so weird, like, I'm just like a stopping, I'm just like another part of the puzzle. So I, I, all, I try to talk about my parents regularly when I'm talking about my work because what they've provided me, being able to go to art school. My father was in the military, my mom's a nurse. Like going to art school is such a weird thing. And they were totally like, our son's completely insane. Let's like let him go to art school and, and find himself or whatever. Um, so I regularly talk about my parents in that way and I feel pride. My daughter's horrible, as you can see. Uh, <laughs> and that's my dad, he's horrible too. Uh, <laughs> And so I, I start every presentation with a picture of my parents. Like every single presentation I start with the same picture because I, I want it to be clear that I, I only have what I have because of them, like starting off. But I also have a beautiful supportive wife and two beautifully insane daughters. And, 
They have helped me. I've always been somewhat playful at heart and kind of childlike. My wife's always like, I have three kids. Uh, <laughs> but they have, they have also helped, helped me kind of see, the, continue to see the world through fresh eyes, right? Because like as I get older and more like dated and like kind of bored of the world, they're always remind me like, birds are cool. Look at the shell of a cricket or whatever it is, you know? So, um, sure, there are tons. It, anyone that has kids knows it's like impossible to balance everything. Um, it is, it's super hard work, but um, they are, are constantly reminding me what's important about family and community and seeing the parts of the world that we continue to overlook. Um, and so, <clears throat> yeah, they're, they're a big part of how I see the world and how I engage with public space. And like designing a playground was one of those opportunities where I could focus on kids entirely, right? Like I could be a big kid and, um, and, and create a space that will be where thousands of kids go to burn off energy and have fun all the time, which is, which is really cool. Um, and like that playground is like a, a hub of social interaction. You're horrible. <laughs> I was joking earlier that my daughters have only heard me say things like, shut up! <laughs> and so they've been listening to me talk for third, whatever, an hour. They have no idea what's going on anymore. Uh, so, you know, family is hugely important. Community is hugely important. I try to, like, make a point of that every time I talk about work. Because um, ultimately, it's like how I see public art functioning is reweaving the social fabric of community or just weaving it tighter than it already is. Um, and I think after the past five years, COVID aside, we've seen that like the social fabric of America specifically is, um, it's in rough shape. And public art is just one of the tools we can use to like help create a stronger and stronger community. So I don't know if that answers your question. Well said. Thank you. Mark, if you'll permit me to oh, ask yeah. a question. Oh boy. Can yeah. you tell us about projects that you have in development right now and what you're working on next and where we may see your work next? Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. Um, Great question. So someone asked me earlier if I only work on one project at a time, <clears throat> which is, it's completely impossible financially to only work on one project at a time. I have like six going at any given time. Um, so the next one's coming up. I have one at the New York Public Library, which would be a cool series of bronze objects installed throughout the library. That'd be a fun one because I've just not worked with bronze before. Um, I have a project in Arlington, Virginia, which will be a pavilion, so very much a functional space that will be going up in a couple of months. Um, and another project in a plaza in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, so those are the ones that will be happening this year. And they have a project in Fort Worth, Texas, and one in San Diego, um, one in Chattanooga. <coughs> I think that's it. So they're, again, they're all over the country. They're all different materials. Like Cambridge, I really like because I'm using Corten steel, which I've not used before. Uh, Corten steel is a, a beautiful material where it's net, it's, it's, it rusts. It forms a patina on its exterior, but that's the intention, right? That's its protective coating. Very different than how stainless steel protects itself. Um, so I'm in, in bronze for the New York, Public New York Public Library project. So I'm constantly, with every new site, I'm trying to explore new materials and new processes if I can, just to push myself, have a better understanding, a wider understanding, wider knowledge of uh, materials, processes, and sites. Uh, but that's a handful of stuff. That we're and in the six or so projects that you've just shared your, your in development on, I guess something that I've appreciated about your work and, and maybe where you differ from other public artists is you really, really are very site specific. It is not the case that somebody would say, oh, there's a Mark Regelman, and, and they may, they may understand you no. and your humor and yeah, your, yeah, yeah. your viewpoint on the world, and therefore it becomes quite obvious that it's you, but you're, the way that you work is not to um, uh, serve your interest visually and yeah. have that replicate when your work appears. It really becomes so deeply personal to the communities where you work, so. I'm curious your thoughts on that, that observation about your work and if you feel that that is still the trend in the projects you have in development. Yeah, for sure. And it's actually, it's a terrible business model because no one knows me, right? They'll see my work and really like it, but they have no idea it's a Mark Riegelman. It's like, it's actually a bad thing. It, it's, a, it's bad in a lot of ways because you're just like, also, if you hire me, you have no idea what you're going to get, right? That's the other problem. It's like, it, it's just like, a, I'm a super unknown in, in, a lot of these, in a lot of these projects and competitions. Um, <clears throat> but for me, 
it's always been, in, I, didn't, I didn't work in a gallery space. I've never worked in a gallery space for a number of reasons. Um, and one of them is like, I don't want to be forced to have to do a thing. Um, and, <clears throat> and for me to stay kind of true to the foundation of my work, which is uh, I want to create community. I want it to be site specific. It needs to be te tethered to the site. I'm always an outsider. It really, every single project, I try my best to make sure that the site informs, you know, informs the work. And um, sometimes that means color, sometimes that means material, fabrication processes, lifespan. Um, but I, I think if you were to look at my body of work, you could find some threads, like iconic silhouettes, um, shapes of playfulness. Uh, you know, there, there, are, there are themes, but they're, they're pretty subtle. Um, and I do, I do try to make sure that each project is unique and inseparable from the site formally and conceptually. Like that is part of the thing. Like you couldn't take this project and put it somewhere else and have it make sense. It would make no sense, right? It would be disconnected in every way. At least that's how I see it. Um, so I, it's very important for my work to, to do that. And I think it's the, the best approach for um, creating work that communities will enjoy for decades, right? Because again, oftentimes I leave these projects and sometimes never see them again or don't see them for many, many years. So it's, it's, it's vital for them to be connected to the communities that will be seeing them every single day. Very true. Any other last questions for Mark before we wrap up? With that, I want to I thank you so sense. very much, Mark, for um, sharing your thoughts with us today. Matthew, for the, the inquisition that was beautifully done. We absolutely yeah, appreciate your, your preparation <laughs> and, and the beautiful conversation. Really fun. Mark, thank you for making our community better. This is just absolutely stunning to have be a part of our lives now. Thank and um, it really is going to make uh, and will continue to make Columbus a, a better city because you've touched us. So thank you so much thank for that. Thank you very much. Wow. Um, I want to, um, uh, again, thank the city of Columbus for all of its very hard work and the many, many partners and community members that went into making this project happen. Um, this is a, a fun day in the short north, and the fun does not have to stop, even though we had to um, <laughs> modify the way we wanted to celebrate uh, after the talk ended, so there will be no food and drink, unfortunately, but we invite you to stick around and hang out with Mark and chat with him personally if you'd like, um, or to enjoy Gallery Hop. We have gallery guides um, uh, upon entrance. There's wonderful art exhibitions taking place at the many galleries throughout the neighborhood. There's a live mural painting event that's taking place um, at the cap uh, behind Hyde Park. Um, we have two artists working out there today. Um, and then, you know, as, as we've shared a little bit, public art, um, uh, it can happen in many ways in our community. It can happen through incredible um, Herculean investments through the part of the city for their percent for art project, or it can happen through private efforts. So the Short North Alliance has been engaged uh, for many years now in trying to enhance and elevate public art in our community. Um, and we do that through uh, hard work, fundraising, and, and the generous donations um, from members of our community. So if you feel so inclined and interested to help us enable more public art happen here in the Short North Arts District, you can visit shortnorth.org slash donate. Um, and your gift can uh, certainly make the Nestark project happen for us. Thank you for being with us today and uh, enjoy this very warm and sunny afternoon in the Short North Arts District. Take care.